As we, uh, we get a couple minutes left here, a um, couple questions that, a whole series of questions yeah. came around the concept of funding. You talked about being bootstrapped. So talk a little bit about the personal challenges of being bootstrapped and how you made that work, how you didn't have to go out for institutional money to, to make this start. No, you know, and so I'm not too ideological about this. I actually think in this environment, um, if I was doing it, uh, again, at, as a first-time entrepreneur, uh, I'd probably raise funding. So I'm not, I'm not here to suggest that you should be bootstrapped. Um, that just happened to be our story, and it really speaks to how much Chicago has evolved. We started this in 06, and it was a very, very different environment back then uh, to stay here and to build a business. Um, so it was more a, a result and a function of our times. But it, it's obviously very challenging because you're strapped for cash. So you have to do a lot. You know, you, you, uh, I always thought we would build this golden management team you know, in the business school sense and to cover each of the, the specialties that we needed to cover in the beginning. Uh, and then you'd go out and um, uh, be so methodical about it and, and um, strategize so much. And I think the thing that bootstrapping does is it makes you embrace the idea that each day is really precious because you don't have that many days. And so you really have to think, what am I going to do in the next two months that's going to allow me to stay in business for the next two? And you have a survival instinct built into you, right, where you constantly are looking at what can kill me. Um, and uh, you know, even today, like we wake up sometimes and, you know, yeah, there's challenges, but... I talked to Charlie and said, man, are we missing something? I mean, why? there's no existential threat. It feels really strange. Um, and so that builds a certain mentality into you in the first year or two that may be harder to appreciate. It creates a fierce sense of urgency. Um, but in terms of what we did, you know, we didn't pay ourselves, right? So that's, I mean, you know, you have to make some of the trade-offs. We had to hire people who were in positions of flexibility where they could take depressed uh, uh, wages. We had to hire people who didn't have to do these things for the first time, rather than going to very experienced people who had done it before. Um, all of those things actually came with a lot of benefits in retrospect. We also have to be pragmatic. I mean, you know, you have to sometimes do what gets you to the next step, so you have the optionality to pursue the next thing. Um, and that's very important. Um, you know, if we cared exclusively about product in the beginning, because we had $5 million in the bank, I'm not sure we would have learned as much as we did to make our product better than we would have conceptualized in the beginning, which is what a lot of the lean stuff comes out of. Go make something and go talk to people because that process of iterative improvement is going to lead to a much better product than you sitting with a smart team in well, an urgency, office. And urgency is a way of doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. Urgency is a huge way to do it. No question. What about you, Shrata? What Talk about your experience uh, bootstrapping. How was it to be the person, you know, having to live that, walk yeah. that walk? I think what it also brought us is an intense um, focus. We couldn't go into eight markets altogether. We really had to pick, we really had to gain market share and then continue to expand. Um, I think it uh, taught us prioritization, definitely urgency, um, and really kind of being resourceful. There's a lot of things that we learned to do, and you know, I love all the universities in the area. We had some great talent that was in, intern talent. Um, we had a lot of affiliations, partnerships with medical associations, with a lot of other, and I think it forced us to look, all right, there's certain things that we do really well. What are those? What are the things that we can look to the community, to resources, to partnerships, affiliations, to help continue to build that and grow that? And so it helped us, it forced us, and it made us appreciate how much working together, working with organizations meant, and continues to mean to us as we continue to grow, having those early relationships, you know, they've worked with us from day one. They've seen us, again, build this from um, all along, and it is that sense of relationship, it's that embeddedness that they've been invested in our success, and, you know, hopefully they'll be very long-term um, relationships and affiliations for us. That's great. I'd love now, to take a second on please. this to make this more practical, right? So normally when you think of do more with less, what I get a lot of is do less with less, right? I mean, people just cut the budget and they do less. They're not doing more with less. Now, bootstrapping actually makes you do more with less. Because if you don't do more, you won't live. And you have to use less because you don't have more. And so I'll give you an, what does that mean, right? I'll tell you exactly what that means. So we wanted to buy advertising in medical journals, uh, books, you know, print publications that physicians read. Now, we didn't have the money that pharma companies have. So Sean would call them never having bought ads before. We sold ads for NBR, but never having bought them. 
And we would try to buy these ads, and we'd be competing with Pfizer and a bunch of big companies. And you know, we, we couldn't pay it, but we had to get in there, right? So you couldn't buy a less tiered journal because that would give you less results. That's just doing less with less. So we figured out that if we called them the last day physically possible that you could get it in, right? It's remnant advertising. They would cut absurd deals. And if we aggregated our buys, normally what, what, what startups want to do is they want to buy less, right? But we said, well, we, we don't really care. We know this is going to work. We're fine to commit to six deals. But we're going to pay very, very little. And we're happy to let you run us whenever you have remnant advertising. It's kind of understanding their cost drivers. That's how you do more with less. It's not just, what's my budget? Let me be under it. That's less with less. So bootstrapping created a culture of more with less. Once that culture of more with less was there, we could infuse capital in it. But if you don't get that culture, you get autoimmune out, right? Just because our culture looks at it and says, you're not one of us. And so from a cultural standpoint, those early days were so valuable because you, know, you really understand what doing more with less means. Because you hear it a lot, but a lot of organizations are not doing more with less. You know, they're just doing less. I wish less. I thought of the remnant advertising. It is. Huge. <laughs> but you have every single business process, that's the level of you know, creativity we went through. Field Same services, way. logistics, anything. So how long did it take you to get profitable? Break even was pretty quickly. <laughs> um, a year. You know, so we started in April 06, but we were still part time in school. 07 was our first full year. By 08, we were already marginally profitable. 09, you know, again, break even, 10 profitable, this year profitable. And so what, what can you say about your revenue, your growth, yeah. where you're going? We still have a very, very long way to go. Uh, we operate in a big market, but we're tracking to well over $20 million in sales, which for a little company that started out, um, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're pleased about. We're really happy about that. Fantastic. And we're also proud of the fact that there's a lot of social utility to what we do and that we make good money. Um, we think that as we hit our, our goals next year, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to be in the double digits on, uh, on our bottom line earnings. And that's important to us because a lot of times those two things are on different ends of the equation. And we think that it's a, the only real long-term competitive advantage you is social utility. You double digits in there. Double digits. Yeah, that's all I'm committing to. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, now you guys didn't take professional money or did you take? No, the, we had friends and family angels, but no institutional money. And so... Was that the right call for you? And what, what, what would you, you know, you talked a little bit about yeah. being available. Well, I think it was the right call for us. Probably wasn't the right call for some of them at the time. I'm joking. <laughs> I, I, no, I'm just, just playing. Um, no, listen, I wish that we had attracted the interest of intelligent VCs that would have been value added. Um, there's no doubt that we could have done uh, more sooner and faster had we done that. Um, but again, I like to think of the decision from their side. You've got young people uh, saying that, hey, we're going to go sell into healthcare, this really fragmented market. But what way it gets better, uh, that's not going to make us any money. Uh, that's only going to cost us money. Then we're going to do enterprise sales into pharmaceuticals, which we know nothing about. And, you know, that requires scale. I mean, it just it seems crazy. Your elevator so, pitch is awesome. Right, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure of, you know. I mean, it, it's, it's a crazy idea in a way. So, so. so this, is, this is an interesting thing. But the next chapter, you're growing really quickly. We are. I mean... I've heard you, you know, you, you, you'll double in some period of reasonable period of time. Yeah. Um, you know, might, might uh, um, investment help to help you grow be in the future or to monetize or for yeah. a reason? Well, so here's what's interesting about our market. We think about this, right, because, you know, it's nice to get all the, the, the calls from PE firms. The thing about our business is we can't just slam $100 million on it because it has to be absorbed by the ad markets. So the inventory we generate it has to be absorbed because we're demand originating, not demand servicing, right? So while we grow inventory, we're going to brand managers, to pharmaceuticals, we're introducing and educating them on an entirely new class of media that they're not used to buying. So we don't pump out display ads. If I did that or I had just a ton of viewership on TV, I could pump a ton of money into it and we would generate a bunch of inventory that'd be sold. When you're demand originating and you have to educate buyers, you know, you have to be sensitive to how quickly a uh, uh, growth can be absorbed. No, that's so, a, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, the, it's Matt's thing about leaning into the market. The problem with an, uh, like it's the evangelical double sale, here's why you need to buy this and here's why you need to buy it from me, you know, it does create some, uh, there is some, some runway you got to create there.